So BlackRock just recently held a private closed door meeting for their institutional investors where they told them that a 28% allocation to Bitcoin was part of an optimal portfolio. But this wasn't the first time that BlackRock has actually held a private meeting with their high end clients where they've told them privately that a very high portfolio allocation to Bitcoin is actually optimal. So today we're going to be running the numbers and having a look at what would happen if the entire world wanted to rebalance to a 28% Bitcoin allocation. And we're going to be showing you why 0.1 Bitcoin could actually be generational wealth in this hypothetical scenario, okay? So to explain all of this, let's start out with the recent news, okay? This was a new meeting that BlackRock just held with their clients. We can see it. Just in, BlackRock holds secret Bitcoin meeting with only its top clients, and we've had some insiders leak some details about this meeting. So we can see, at a recent special event hosted by BlackRock, high-profile clients and industry participants were invited to discuss the future of Bitcoin. Bitcoin company Swarm Bitcoin, one of the participants of the event, shared with us some important takeaways with Swarm's private uh, customers. So we can see here uh, that at the event, an analyst from BlackRock gave a presentation about how to value and model Bitcoin in a portfolio. And the BlackRock analyst suggested a surprising number to participants, a 28% allocation to Bitcoin. Okay, again, this is absolutely massive. This is big news, but this isn't the first time that BlackRock has held a closed door meeting for its investors and its clients where they said, look, we're very bullish on Bitcoin and we are recommending that an optimal portfolio allocation is very, very high, almost as high as the fireworks in the background of today's video. We're going to get to that second, uh, we're going to break down the math behind BlackRock's second closed door meeting uh, with Bitcoin. Uh, but first, let's have a look at the validity of this because a, a couple of people have kind of said, okay, did this happen? Uh, obviously, obviously, BlackRock hasn't come out and you know publicly admitted to holding this closed door meeting. So let's see whether it's true first before we run the numbers on this hypothetical you know portfolio allocation. So BlackRock is known to have one of the largest distribution networks worldwide, and it plans to spread this information beyond just its top customers according to Swan Bitcoin. Once its top customers have had time to digest this information and probably allocate to Bitcoin based on this information, we can say the company is expected to share it with its entire customer base. So that article and that final sentence is very important to think about. Once its top customers have had time to digest this information, then they're going to go and market Bitcoin publicly. Okay, so again, this article that we were reading mentioned Swan Bitcoin a couple of times. So let's have a look on Twitter. I couldn't find much validating this, uh, you know, uh, this closed door meeting, but Swan participated. So we can see here Fred Kruger put out a tweet recently and it was just 28%. Uh, coming from uh, Stephen Lubka, Swan attended a BlackRock institutional event where there was strong interest that was not expected. Um, so we can see here, if you scroll down and have a look, even the ETF guru, Eric Balkunas, got involved and he was kind of asking. And look, Stephen kind of confirmed it here. To be clear, this wasn't them saying, we are doing this in our funds. It was a quant from BlackRock who said a 28% allocation wasn't unreasonable. So I'll let you guys come to your own conclusions. In a closed door private meeting, a BlackRock maths quant is saying that a 28% allocation to Bitcoin isn't unreasonable. Well, let's run the numbers of what the world might actually look like if all of the other money managers around the world begin to think, you know what? 28% allocation to Bitcoin might not be unreasonable. Well, let's have a look at the maths uh, because I did run the maths just before I jumped on this live stream with you guys. So let's have a look. We can see that there's $900 trillion of wealth in the world. Now, again, we're running, this is a hypothetical experiment. So, you know, let's assume that 
you know, we don't lose a lot of value in other asset classes as these other asset classes try to rebalance their portfolios. Um, so again, let, that's just a, you know, a hypothetical kind of caveat there. But we can see if 28% of 900 trillion is a $252 trillion market cap. Okay. Now, again, this is where most people go wrong with their maths equations because they don't account for the fact that there is a multiplier effect. Okay. So we have $252 trillion of demand, but not all the 21 million Bitcoin are actually available for sale. So now we have to use our multiplier effect. And when we do, the maths gets even more bullish because when we kind of, uh, if we were to have a look at a little bit of a long-term average of the multiplier effect, we can see that I think using a 4x multiplier effect is probably fair and reasonable. When you actually have a look at the on-chain data, uh, typically right now, the multiplier effect is 4.5x. So the two-year moving average is actually 4.5x. So I don't uh, so I don't think using four is a you know an outlandish assumption. But when you do use that 4x multiplier um, and you times that by the $252 trillion of demand. You've actually got a you've got a 1.008 quadrillion dollar market cap. So it's nearly exactly one quadrillion dollars. Then you can actually divide by 21 million Bitcoin because you've actually accounted for the fact not all the 21 million Bitcoin are available for sale. And you guys can probably see the numbers. I'm going to try to zoom it up for you, but you can see that under this hypothetical experiment. That leads you to be looking at a $48 million price tag per Bitcoin. Now, again, where does generational wealth come into this? Well, if you hold 0.1 Bitcoin, and if you're able to hold it through all of the volatility that would come under this hypothetical experiment of the entire world trying to rebalance their portfolios to get a 28% Bitcoin allocation, all of a sudden 0.1 Bitcoin would be worth about $4.8 million in purchasing power today. Okay, so again, we're not talking about hyperinflation. We're not talking about hyperinflated dollars. We're talking about purchasing power today based upon the current world's wealth of $900 trillion. So that's pretty bullish, right? 0.1 Bitcoin um, could potentially equal $4.8 million of purchasing power. Pretty bullish, yes. But let's not forget, BlackRock's actually ran another secret report where that actually also got leaked to the public. Got to ask yourself, are these things, you know, just coincidentally being leaked to the public? Or I don't know, I'll let you guys uh, stew on that and have a think about that. Before we jump straight into uh, the maths of that second one, uh, g'day to Johnny Midas, he's in the chat. And now we have Rob Wallace saying it was at a Bitcoin investor day in New York City last week. Robbie Michnik of BlackRock said their clients were far and away more interested in Bitcoin than any other crypto asset. Now that is true. We actually have an article backing that up from the Bitcoin News website that I actually want to show you guys because we published this, I believe it was yesterday. And we can see this is coming from BlackRock. Bitcoin is overwhelmingly the number one priority for investors. Okay. This, this is like Rob said, coming from Robbie Michnik head of digital assets at BlackRock. So if you guys do want to read this full article, we, re uh, we recommend you head on over and check it out. Uh, we have a pretty snazzy little website where we are breaking down the daily news uh, for Bitcoin for the readers. Okay. Now for the YouTube video enjoyers, let's move on and have a look at this second BlackRock paper and this second report that some people might've missed. So this one was a little bit of an older one but it came out in 2022. So we tweeted about this and we said, I'm going to zoom this up so you guys can see it, sorry. Uh, reminder, last summer, BlackRock put out a paper stating that a, uh, starting that, uh, well, sorry, stating, starting with a 60-40 equity-based bond portfolio, the optimal Bitcoin allocation is a large 84.9%. So this was, again, a closed-door meeting coming from BlackRock. And this actually got leaked 
to the public. And this was well before BlackRock actually kind of filed for their Bitcoin uh, spot ETF. So 84.9%. And this kind of uh, recommendation was based upon the past 11 or 12 years of data. Okay, so obviously Bitcoin's appreciated a lot over those past 11 or 12 years of data, which is why it would have made sense to hold so much Bitcoin over those past 10 years. Um, now, again, th let's think about this hypothetically. Um, you know, what is the price of Bitcoin if the entire world tried to take this optimal uh, portfolio allocation onto Bitcoin? Okay, well, I'm glad you asked because I actually ran the numbers of this in a recent live stream. And we actually determined that this, again, hypothetical experiment would act actually bring about a, I think it was $148 million Bitcoin. Okay. So again, ridiculous numbers. For those who missed it, this is the article. Uh, BlackRock recommends 84.9% Bitcoin allocation in equity and bond portfolios. Okay. Which is pretty incredible when you guys uh, think about it. It's absolutely amazing. Okay. So here's the data. So it was 11 years of data. So BlackRock researchers analyzed Bitcoin's returns from 2010 to 2021. And this is where they came up with the maths, okay? Which is pretty incredible uh, when we think about it. Okay, so again, uh, there's the maths for both of those hypothetical scenarios. Um, again, the caveat there is that, you know, it's going to be very difficult for the entire world to rebalance their portfolios into Bitcoin. But BlackRock's actually made some recent moves that kind of gives this hypothetical scenario more credence. Recently, BlackRock is actually putting its money where its mouth is. And BlackRock holds obviously $10 trillion of assets. We all know that. But they hold lots of other different global asset funds. So let's have a look at what BlackRock's done in the past four weeks alone, because they're starting to put Bitcoin in all of their other investment buckets, which is absolutely fascinating. So let's have a look at this. So we can see here by this article, BlackRock it's loading. BlackRock plans to acquire spot Bitcoin ETPs in its global allocation fund. Okay, so this is massive. And this was, again, recent. So have a look at the date. This is March 2024. Uh, Thursday's filing with the SEC uh, shows that BlackRock actually wants to add Bitcoin ETPs to its $36 billion strategic income opportunities fund, which is massive. So we can see, but that's not the only thing BlackRock's done. It has another fund called the Global Allocation Fund, which is an $18 billion fund. And BlackRock is purchasing spot Bitcoin ETPs, including its own iBit product for this fund, the Global Allocation Fund. So again, this is massive. BlackRock is saying very bullish things in public, but behind closed doors, they are also backing up these very bullish Bitcoin predictions by including more and more Bitcoin in all of their other allocational funds, okay? They're not, it would just be one thing to just launch a Bitcoin spot ETF, okay? But Larry Fink's doing much more than that. He's going on national TV defending Bitcoin, and now he's also including Bitcoin in all of his other funds. So this is, again, some people will say, okay, the world will never rebalance their entire portfolio allocations to have a 28% Bitcoin allocation. You know, maybe that's true. Again, this is just a hypothetical thought experiment, massive caveat. We're just showing the maths of what the world would look like under this hypothetical scenario. But it's very interesting to see BlackRock actually putting its money where its mouth is. And it's going out there into its own you know, individually managed funds and putting more and more Bitcoin into it. Okay. So this is very, very bullish. Now, something else that is incredibly bullish is watching what Larry says um, on mainstream television about Bitcoin. I might show you a quick clip from what Larry is actually saying on live TV about Bitcoin before we show you the last article I want to play for you guys today. So we can see here, this is Larry, and I think the title of this tweet is very important for today's video. Betting against Larry Fink and Bitcoin right now is like trying to win a thumb war with Thanos. Okay, that's a great tweet. It really is. Uh, so I'm going to play this video of uh, Larry Fink on national TV recently talking about Bitcoin. That there's a lot of merit to it. 
there's a lot of opportunity. It is a great store, and this is where you can debate. Is it a good store? Do you know how it's made? A bunch of computers figure out. But there's problems. only. But the issue is if there, if people believe that it can be a, an asset that can be cross border. Right. And let's be clear: if you're in a country where you're fearful of your government, and maybe this is one of the reasons why China has banned it. Mm -hmm. If you're in a government where you're, if you're in a country where you're fearful of your future, fearful of your right. government, or you're frightened that your government is devaluing its currency by too much deficits, like us. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> go to the little elephant in the room. Here. Yeah. <laughs> You could say this is a great potential long-term store of value. And it, as I said, it's like digital gold. And I, and I believe... But you still can't buy a slice of pizza with it. Isn't it, that kind it, of odd no, that we're... But you can't buy a, a price of pizza with palladium or, or gold. No, but there you can do stuff with them. I can get stuff. With, I mean, people use gold for, for stuff, right? But you, you, people, you could buy and sell your Bitcoin. No different than gold. So I think, again, that's the signal there, guys. Larry Fink is on live television and he's actually defending Bitcoin. It would be very easy for him to just roll over in that conversation when the, uh, you know, news anchor kind of questions him and kind of says, yeah, but, you know, you can't really, you know, you, you can't buy things with Bitcoin. It would be very easy for Larry to kind of roll over. and But no, he's defending Bitcoin because as Rob says in the chat, BlackRock already owns 243,000 Bitcoin and they want a whole lot more. Future Boy says the inflows will be crazy over the next few years, which is very, very interesting uh, because I think that's probably true, especially considering what the other largest money managers around the world are doing with their Bitcoin allocations, potentially because of what BlackRock is saying. So I have another article that I want to show you guys. So there's this one, another BlackRock mutual fund can now allocate to Bitcoin ETFs. This is a continuation of the trend of more and more of this $10 trillion that BlackRock manages is making its way into Bitcoin. This is massive because as we can see, the competitive FOMO is actually starting to play out because an expert predicts Bitcoin at 750000 as Fidelity advises its clients that they should have a 1% to 3% allocation in Bitcoin, okay? Again, this is massive. In a major shift within the financial industry, Fidelity Investments with its colossal $12 trillion in assets under administration that the traditional 60-40 should evolve to include a 1% to 3%. Oh, yuck. They said the word crypto. But they're talking about Bitcoin because they're saying specifically you should have a 1% to 3% allocation through our Bitcoin spot ETF, FBTC. Okay. So again, this is the competitive nature and the competitive feedback loop that we're seeing all around the world today. When one asset manager begins to adopt Bitcoin and Bitcoin appreciates by 50% after their ETF launch, naturally, we, we see lots of other rumblings um, happening in the corridors of these other world's largest asset managers. So Fidelity is number two. And now they're talking about, you know, allocating more and more of their clients' funds to Bitcoin. Naturally, we also saw the CEO of Vanguard step down only four weeks after he said, sorry, Vanguard's not going to actually allow our clients to buy the Bitcoin ETFs. Okay. Again, some people have speculated. Maybe that has to do with the fact that uh, you know Bitcoin, the Bitcoin price ripped by fifty percent. Again, I'll leave the speculation to you guys. But I think right now it's becoming interesting. It's becoming even more obvious that Bitcoin is under allocated to in the world. Okay. Now, while we're talking about the world, how much money is there in the world? Well. There's this really cool website, and I don't think I've shown it on the Bitcoin News YouTube channel before. So let's take a look at it because it's kind of comparing Bitcoin to the rest of the assets all around the world, okay? Now, again, if you're new to the Bitcoin News uh, YouTube channel, Rob says it nicely, 85 live viewers, smash the like button. If you're new here, welcome. We do live streams like this multiple times throughout the week. So if you're enjoying it, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next ones. But we can see here, Let's compare Bitcoin to the rest of the world's assets, okay? So this is 
all of the cryptocurrency market cap. Okay, it's about three trillion. These tiny blocks here. But have a look at the rest of the world. Okay, we've got we've got literally we got twelve trillion dollars of gold here. This is just a really cool visualization to show you how small Bitcoin is in comparison to the rest of the world. We got twenty eight trillion dollars on central bank balance sheets. We've got. $30 trillion in the S&P 500. We've got hundreds of trillions of dollars in the global money supply. We've got, what, $300 trillion of global debt. We've got $330 trillion in the global real estate market. Again, is it crazy to think that Bitcoin can take 5% of all of this money that's looking for a safer home or a better place to park its capital, okay? I don't think it's that crazy, okay? I really don't think it would be wild to assume that Bitcoin can actually capture a large percentage of this kind of portfolio that we're seeing um, all around the world. We got $900 trillion of wealth. That's an incredible amount of money. I don't know why BlackRock, um, I don't think it's controversial when BlackRock says Bitcoin could potentially capture 28% of this in the future. Well, that's not what BlackRock said. BlackRock said that maybe you should consider a 28% uh, allocation to Bitcoin. But again, it's very interesting to see that the Overton window is shifting, okay? The Overton window is shifting very, very quickly, and not many people are kind of predicting just how quickly things could shift except for maybe Samson Mao, okay? So if you guys didn't know, we recently held an interview with the one and the only Samson Mao. You can see it up on screen right now. And he actually made the case for why we could see a $1 million Bitcoin in literally this time span of days to weeks because of the supply suffocation being created by the world's largest asset manager like Larry Fink. So if you want to watch that one, check it out. We got it up on screen right now. And with all that said, thank you to everyone who tuned in today. I would have kept this live stream going a little bit longer, but I am actually running late to another meeting. So I'm going to have to go. Uh, you're going to catch me in another live stream during the week. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that one. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. We will see you guys in the next.